this morning I'm going to open in prayer, and then we're going to uh, we're going to to look at this passage, and I'm going to share some things that God has put on my heart about it. Let us pray. Father, this morning I I do come to you, and uh, I ask for uh, your Spirit to speak through me this morning and to say the things that we all need to hear, uh, to teach us all. I pray, Father, for uh, for us to learn some things about how to deal with difficult people, because we we're in front of them every day. You know, we're sometimes we're the difficult people. Uh, help us to recognize when we are. But Father, I just pray that you teach us and guide us and lead us as we uh, look through this study this morning. And I just thank you so much that that you've given me this message, uh, that you've shown me the things that I needed to know and that I needed to see. I just love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, real quick, by the way, uh, if you're going to send a child to camp, uh, please get your apps in. Uh, we still short some of the apps from the kids here in the church, so it'll be here in a month, uh, first week of July. So, <laughs> But let's, uh, let's look at Luke 15, 22 to 32. Beginning of verse 22, it says, But the father said to his servants, The son has come, by the way, the son has come home, the prodigal. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Verse 24, For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So he called one of the servants, um, oh, excuse me, meanwhile, verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. He says, your brother has come, uh, and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became very angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Webster defines uh, the word difficult, and I just added it to the word people, but he defines the word difficult. They're hard to deal with. Uh, They're hard to manage. They're hard to understand or they're hard to overcome. And when we get these types of people in our lives, we tend to... Uh, approach them from man's point of view, from human viewpoint. Hard to deal with people. We either remove them or fight with them. Uh, You know, say a child, we can't remove them, so we just constantly fight with them, constantly battle with them. Uh, If it's, say, a business and you've got a difficult person, you just, they're hard to deal with, you just fire them, just get rid of them. Um, If they're hard to manage, and you continue to keep them around, you just keep lessening the expectations until little is accomplished. You know, I'm trying to get you to do this, you refuse to do this, well then just do it this way. Well, if you can't do that, then do it this way until finally you just, you've dumbed down the situation so much to where, you know, they're really not doing anything. Uh, Hard to understand. Uh, You start labeling them and name calling. You know, you're an idiot. You just you just don't have brain power. You you just don't get it. You just you, you know why do you not understand what I'm trying to tell you? Why are you making this so difficult? And then hard to overcome. You just give up, and move on. I'm I'm done with you. You become empathetic. You really don't you really don't hate them, or you just don't care one way or the other. Just I know I don't know, and I don't care. It's, you know, that's the empathy. Um, and so that's the, that's the areas that the human view takes when we're dealing with difficult people. We tend to take the path of least resistance until we just say, I'm done with you. You know, if I can't get rid of you, I'll just ignore you. I'll just, I'll just you know, whatever. 
And by the way, I need Sherry. Uh, I'm taking throat lozenges for this, and I know I'm going to start rattling them and smacking them, and I apologize if I do. Sherry, maybe give me some kind of a sign if you see me doing it or hear me doing that. Uh, some biblical examples of some uh, difficult people, you know, Judas Iscariot, um, Pharaoh, and even Jonah, one of God's people. Uh, Judas wanted his will to be done. You know, Judas, uh, Judas was looking for a political messiah. He wanted somebody to come in and overthrow Rome, and when that didn't happen, he didn't get the way he wanted. You know, he turned on Jesus. Uh, Pharaoh refused to bend, bend to God's will. You know, God tried and tried and tried with Pharaoh, and he just wouldn't, he wouldn't go where God wanted him to go. And then Jonah is a lot like us in many ways at times. Jonah chose to do God's work, but not to do God's will. You know, God said, Jonah... I want you to go preach. He said, sure, I'll go preach. Well, be, I want you to preach here. No, I don't want to do that. I'm going to preach, but I'm going to preach where I want to preach. You know, I, I said it for years. Uh, I came out of Gate City Housing Project, and that's the last place I ever wanted to go back to. You know, I wanted to go preach to middle-class white kids in Mountain Brook. I didn't want to go back to housing projects, and that's where Chuck kept send, or, uh, God kept sending me through Chuck. You know, we'd go to youth detention centers and drug rehab centers and housing projects, and I kept thinking, I don't want to go there. I want to go somewhere where, you know, people are, smell nice and they look nice and they, act, they behave a little better, and I was wanting to do God's work, but my will. That's what Jonah was fighting, and as a result, he was he's, he's deemed difficult. The older brother in Luke 15 is best known as being difficult. Uh, last time I taught on the prodigal son a, f- a few weeks ago, I made the statement, many say the story of the prodigal son is his education on the sinful life, but I also see a lesson in the importance of his relationship with his father. That was the statement I made. This statement stands for the older brother as well. He's got, he's, his problem is with his father. His problem is with uh, uh, his attitude about several things that's going on in his life at this point. Uh, Luke 15, 1 and 2 sets up the story with two classes of people, sinners and religious people. That's the two brothers. The prodigal is the sinner, the religious people, the, se- the scribes, the Pharisees. That's the older brother. Big brother was commendable, though. You know, I don't want to be too hard on him. He had some qualities. He was moral. He stayed at home and did run off with the prodigal. He was hard working. He's, you know, verse 25 says he was in the fields working. Uh, he was faithful to his job, where he talks about, Lo, these many years I've served you, in verse 29. But despite his morality, he was outside the circle of fellowship. Literally, he was outside. You know, we, we, Ron, we've used this little drawing for years where you have a cross and, you know, going to the two circles, the family and the fellowship, and you know, when we were outside of the fellowship or in carnality, that's where he was. He was outside the circle. Um, he, he felt like he was doing everything right, and yet he wasn't getting recognized for it. And as a result, he was out of fellowship with his father, with his brother, and with so many others. When reading the story of the two sons, I was told to focus on the father. Both boys were sinners, and the father dealt with them differently, so to achieve the same end, restoration of fellowship. Those of you, not me, those of you that have had more than one child, you know you, they're completely different. Uh, rarely do, do you have two children the same. They're, you know, we, Sherry and I, we had the one, and we can say, oh, it's easy to raise kids. You know, we, we had one that pretty much did what we asked him to, he was a good kid, and What's the, what's the difficult thing about raising children? I mean, you know, they're all the same, right? But those of you that have had more than one child will laugh in my face. and No, 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 no. They're completely, completely different from here to here, and this is a great example of this story. Uh, the father is dealing with the big brother. The father, in dealing with the big brother, never attacked his negativity. But instead, he proposes three questions to him in order to get him to see his sin. You know, when, when we have a tendency to want to point out people's sin, or, when, or excuse me, when somebody wants to point out our sin, we get defensive. 
when I have a bad attitude and Sherry may point it out to me or David or Megan or whoever, when, when they, you know, eh, it's not right. You know, I kind of tend to get a little defensive. I, I, you know, you're wrong, I'm right. And then when I step away and I collect my thoughts and I catch my breath and I realize, you know, they're right. But that's, that's how, that's where the change has to come. It has to come from within inside. You know, if we just you know, run around and we're pointing out somebody's faults and they're not going to change just because we pointed them out. They've got to see them. They've got to recognize them. And this is what the father is doing. He's trying to get him to see his areas of weakness, his problem areas, and he's doing it by asking him some questions. Remorse and change always occur, occurs from within. Um, you know, I've always hated it when a child does something wrong and the parent says, you know, brings them to whoever they offended and says, now apologize to them. Well, there's no remorse in that. It's just, you're just appeasing the parent. You know, they're no more sorry for what they did, but because the parents told them to, you know, to, to apologize, they do. What I want to see in, in that case was true remorse. I want you to understand that what you did was wrong. You shouldn't have done it. And, but you need to see it, not, not me need to point it out to you. So his first question, the father asked the son, the, old, the big brother. He says, why are you outside? Father stays positive and gives reasons for him not to be outside. Again, you know, he's, out, he's not only out, literally outside, he's outside the family, he's outside the fellowship. The father, uh, he, he says there's a party going on inside. We've killed a fatted calf. We have great food. The Jews' primary source of meat was fish. Rarely did they kill their sheep or their cattle because of, you know, they... They reproduction and, and growing the herd, and yeah, they would kill one occasionally for, for, for uh, you know, like the wool or the, the leather and, you know, to make clothing and so forth, but, you know, it, this was not something they did a lot. Uh, their, their main source of food was fish, or main source of meat was fish. Um, they saved the sheep and cattle for other reasons and only ate it on special occasions. He said there's singing and dancing going on in there. There's great fellowship. There's family reunion. And it's the good kind. You know, when I wrote that, uh, there's a family reunion. I thought of some of the family reunions that I've been part of, and I thought, well, you know, to, to tell him there's a family reunion going on inside may not be the best way to sell it. Uh, you know, sometimes when somebody says, well, you know, let's come to this family reunion, and I think back of some of the family reunions I've been to, I think, eh. Yeah, I was reminded of, used to when we'd go to the, do watch the lamb at all these different youth detention facilities. And I would talk, I would give the gospel and I would talk about God being our, you know, uh, being, becoming your father. I, I looked out in the audience one time and I thought, you know, there's a lot of these kids out here, they don't want to know the father. They've had a father that's abused them and, and uh, just did awful things to them. And so that might not be the best way to sell this. Uh, and so, you know, I thought about that when I was thinking about this family reunion, you know, just because... Uh, he's saying it's a family reunion. It may not be the best way to put it, but that's what he's saying. It's come, come in, come see the, your son has come home. Uh, there's rejoicing. Big Brother's answer was in verse 28. He said he was angry and would not go in. And it wasn't just any anger either. It was the dreaded righteous indignation. Jesus' anger. The get thee behind me Satan anger, the turning over the tables anger in the temple. You know, many times Christians read about that and, and we think, well, Jesus was angry, well, I can be angry. Yeah, well, Jesus didn't sin. Can you be angry and not sin? Can you uh, teach a lesson in your anger? Or are you just going to belittle and put down uh, righteous indignation? That's a, that's a, a dangerous thing weapon if you don't have willed it but we feel like we can justify it again because we saw Jesus do it uh, when anger becomes part of your system it drains you from energy rather than the energy going out constructively it goes inward destructively tearing down the others you know Ron calls this inner dialogue he talks about it all the time we get angry we start imagining things and saying things and all of a sudden, that situation gets so much worse than what it was. And your anger builds and builds because now where, you know, uh, they may have just said some little flippant comment, all of a sudden, 
they've chewed you out and cursed you and everything else in your mind because you've built this story up so big and your anger just continues to grow and this, this energy, it just drains you. You're just it's like, instead of turning it outward and trying to be constructive, who was he angry at? Who was the big brother angry at? Number one, he was angry at the father. There was three, three reasons for him to be angry. He was angry at the father for doing for a lesser brother and I don't mean an imma, uh, a spiritually immature brother, but one that he thought was lesser than him. But he was angry for, doing le- for a lesser brother that didn't deserve it. He wasn't angry about the party or even the forgiveness. He perceived the father was rewarding the prodigal for his bad behavior. He was out with all that. He ran off. He spent all your money. He was hanging out with all these people. He comes home and you throw him a party? You know. I don't get it. It, 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 it just, he, was, he was infuriated by it. <clears throat> you see that in verse 30. Uh, and, and you notice in, in verse 30 he says, but when, this, but when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fatted calf for him. He doesn't even, won't even call him his brother. He calls him this son of yours. He don't want to even acknowledge who the guy is. He, that's, how, that's how angry he is. He's, he's angry at his father for giving something to somebody that he doesn't think deserves it because he doesn't understand grace. <laughs> he was angry at his father because <clears throat> his father's grace to his brother. The father gave the prodigal a fatted calf rather than out-of-date milk and moldy bread. You know, that's, what he's, that's what the brother wanted him to give him. Give him that old stuff that's ruined, that's spoiled. He doesn't even really deserve that, but if you're going to give him anything, give him that. Number two... Uh, rather than, he was angry, rather than rejoicing, uh, excuse me, rather than rejoicing for the restored brother, he was angry because he had lost some building blocks for building up himself. Many rejoice in the failures of others because we see ourselves better. Verse 30 says, but just son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes came home. He's, he's got a litany of things. He's pointing out all the things that the brother did that he would never do, at least never get caught doing. This was not his area of weakness. He had no desire to do this, so he was very easy to point out all the failures of his brother, and he's pointed out to his father, you know, he's he's squandered your money. I don't. He's running around with prostitutes. I'm not. He's, you know, fill in the blank. He just goes down this litany. I don't. I don't. I don't. And this is how it makes him look better, and all of a sudden the son comes home. He's restored fellowship with his father, and now they're back on equal equal level, and that that doesn't Sitting well with him. Uh, he goes into great detail pointing out the, the specific sins of the prodigal. Um, as long as the reports of the prodigal's bad behavior was coming in, the brother rejoiced. Because that's where all this story is going. All, all of verse uh, chapter 15 is about rejoicing. It, it, every story in this, in this chapter 15, there's three par- parables, and they all end in rejoicing. And yet the, the the uh, big brother didn't want to have anything to do with that. In Galatians 6, 1, Paul has a test. He says, Brethren, if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. You know, if you've if you got a brother that's falling, that's failing, pick him up, help him up. Uh, it makes us all look good. Because he represents the church. He represents Christ. This was not Big Brother's attitude. There was no meekness. There was no kindness, no love, and there was no compassion. The prodigal's repentance was a threat to his Big Brother. Big Brother was convinced that there was no sin uh, where he was, but there was plenty with the prodigal. You know, all the sins out there where he is, not here. There was, this, uh, there was this Christian college. I, cannot, I wish I could remember the name of it, but they actually had an ad in their brochure one time that you know, they wanted everybody to feel that their kids would, this was the best Christian college to send their kids to. And they, in their brochure it says, uh, there's no sin within 40 miles of our campus. <laughs> Boy. And that's, that's how the prodigal felt. 
You know, there's no sin here. All the sin's out there where the brother is. You know, all the, all the godly is here. You know, I've seen this within, within the Christian community and even in my own life. How do we feel when a televangelist that we don't agree with doctrinally falls? Does this fall glorify God? You know, I've, in my life, gosh, how I many have we seen fall on their face? And, you know, we don't agree with them doctrinally. We don't agree with them scripturally. Uh, and then when they fall, we think, what do we think? I know what I thought. I know the things that went through my mind. Uh, you know, is that, is that where we should be as a family? <clears throat> you might argue that to tell evangelists we don't agree with doctrinally uh, falls. Uh, does that fall glorify God? You might argue that his ministry doesn't glorify God. But be careful of righteous indignation. Again, it's a weapon that few people can handle. A third reason he was angry, he was angry at himself. In verse 29, uh, but he answered his father, Look, after all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. He got a raw deal. He got a bad bargain. He obeyed the rules and got nothing. At least so he thought. All these years I served you and you never gave me so much as a goat. His relationship with his father was based on receiving stuff. That's the danger of the prosperity gospel. One trades following God for stuff. You know, follow God and he'll fill your bank account up. Follow God and you'll have a new house and a new car and a, you know, because stuff is what they think is going to make them happy. Stuff is what they want. Uh, he had no appreciation of his fellowship with his father. He had become complacent with it. He took it for granted. He wanted more because it was no longer enough. You know, the, the fact that we can fellowship with God, that we can talk to God, that we can laugh with God, that we can cry with God, the God of the universe, the God that never needed us, and yet he chose us, the fact that we can have that kind of relationship, and because of that relationship, we can have great joy in times of, of struggles, and, you know, why is that not enough? Why is that not enough? Why do we have to have stuff? Because, you know, stuff can go away. Uh, stuff can, can, you know, I think Gary said one time, it was, well, Gary, if, uh, if a fire, a tornado, or death can take it away, is that, is that how you, I believe it's what you said, uh, then, you know, it's not worth having. And that's what this brother wanted, you know. He wanted stuff. He didn't, the, the relationship with his father, the fact that, I mean, he was in a position because the brother was gone to really enhance the relationship. It was just he and his father. <clears throat> the prodigal son's return home <clears throat> did not create problems but revealed them. Hmm. We start seeing the big brother for who he really is. Now, you know, I, I know this is a, a, a parable, uh, and I, I would hope that we caught the big brother on a bad day, that this was not all the way he was all the time. But, you know, we see him, we see him for, we see his true character. He's put, had, a little, put, he had a little pressure put to him, and all of a sudden his true character pops out. Uh, the problems with him, his little brother revealed. Big brother was physically closer to the father, but just as far removed spiritually as the prodigal. Uh, this goes back to my Jonah reference earlier. You know, the, pro the big brother and Jonah both were doing God's work, the Father's work, but they weren't doing the Father's will. They didn't want to do the Father's will. <clears throat> Second question that the Father asked the big brother, he says, is this costing you anything to be outside? Are you gaining anything by this? <clears throat> it's costing him fellowship with his father and his brother. But again, because of his attitude, he doesn't see that. He doesn't, he doesn't appreciate that. This is something that we take for granted as Christians. We sometimes think that, that 
teaching and learning time only occurs in the classroom setting, you know, here, uh, downstairs. Uh, one of the things I love about our, our Sunday night Bible study at Peggy's and even the times that we have with the kids is there's this group, group dynamic where God uses all the voices, where there's, there's this tremendous amount of, of encouragement, uh, exhortation, you know, pe- things that people in the group would say. We have, we have people from all varying spiritual growths, I guess. And so, you know, we'll talk about something in the Bible study, and I tell the group that, you know, if, if you've got some input, please bring it on, because we have a pretty much spiritually mature group there. And, uh, you know, I just tell them that if we get off course too far, then I'll, bring, uh, I'll call a timeout and bring us back on, but... But there's so, you know, there's so much that can be taught and can be learned just from that little Bible study long before I ever get up and start speaking, long before I start teaching because of the encouragement, the things that people say. Um, and and I'm, the reports I'm getting back from the people that are going, they're absolutely loving it. They are, it, it's, they're getting to, you know, to exhale the things that we've been taught in here for so long. Um, and... You know, Donna, she's she's she goes and she'll uh, interject something, uh, and it's a teaching moment. She'll talk about something God did in her life. <clears throat> you know, uh, it was I say it was also costing the the brother joy by staying outside. First John one nine is a verse that we're all familiar with. We quoted it for years and years, but First John one one through eight it talks about. Uh, hating your brothers and how it affects your relationship with your father. It says our joy is complete in our fellowship with our father. Our joy is completed with our fellowship with our father. That's how important the fellowship with the father is. That's how important it is for that, that big brother to get in that house, to get back in the, in the circle, to get back in fellowship because of, of the joy that goes with it. Because that's where your joy is completed. <clears throat> Notice the desire of the father to, to fellowship with his sons. One son, he ran far off to meet. And the other went outside to find. Uh, he compassionately and lovingly talked to him. He pleaded with him just as he pleaded, just as uh, God pleaded with Pharaoh through Moses. Over, I mean, God could just send Moses in there and just, or didn't have to send Moses. He could just struck him dead. Could have struck the Egypt dead and just said, okay, Jews, walk out. Go, go cross. But God sent, sent Moses in to plead with Pharaoh, please change your mind. Please change your mind. Please repent. You've got to, there's, a, there's a problem in your soul. You need, you need to change it. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You know, that, that's all he was, he just, Moses, stay after him, stay after him, stay after him. Now God's all knowing, God knows what Pharaoh's going to choose and what he's going to do, but Moses didn't. <clears throat> and Moses honored the Lord and, stay, and kept, you know, Pharaoh, let my people go, Pharaoh, let my people go, Pharaoh, the Lord God said, let my people go. You know, he's giving you one more chance. Here's a sign to, See this sign? It's from God. He's, he's serious about this. Let his people go over and over and over. And that's what, you know, the father's doing this. Father's saying, son, please come in. Please come in. He could have said, you know, you and your little snotty attitude standing out here in the fields. Your brothers came home. We thought he was dead. He was as good as dead. He's home now. And here you are being a snippy little brat, you know. You ought to be in there rejoicing. He didn't go that route. He stayed positive. He pleaded with him. He showed him compassion. He showed him love. Come in and rejoice with us. Come in and fellowship with us. This is where this, you know, this is where it happens inside the circle, inside the family, inside the fellowship. The father encourages his son to come and rejoice. Uh, as I said earlier, all three parables in Luke 15 end in rejoicing. Uh, and, and they rejoice because what was lost is found. Big Brother is the only one in this chapter who is not happy. Uh, he's the religious, the scribe, the Pharisee. 
He is serving the Lord with madness, not gladness. It's reported that Gandhi once said, or somebody asked Gandhi, said, what's the biggest hindrance to Christianity? And he said, Christians. You know? And I, when I first read that, I thought, man, that's probably right. And I thought, eh, no, hold on now. Not all of us. I, I want to be in the us part. Uh, not the ones who are Christ-like, just the ones who are religious. You know, I said it last time. Uh, if you're Christ-like, you attract people. If you're religious, you, you, you push them away. And that's, that's who Gandhi was talking about, I hope. <clears throat> the, one, the son's sin was action, or one son's sin was action, and one son's sin was attitude. The father addressed them both in a loving way. You know, he told, he told the son that came back, the prodigal, I love you, I'm going to show my love and my grace and my mercy to you this way. <clears throat> he told the other one, I love you, I want to show my mercy and grace, come in and enjoy, come in and let's have a party. Hey, you want to go get some friends? Bring them, we'll, we'll, we'll let everybody celebrate this thing. Uh, he's trying his best to <clears throat> let it, get him to see this for himself. Question number three, can you, can you go in? The father would be to say to the son, can you go in? Do you have to stay outside? He said, verse 31, my son, the father, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. No, you don't have to stay outside. Yes, you can go in. He just had to see the poison in his life and confess it. He had to see himself for who he really was. It, re it would require humbling himself and seeing what he thought was good was really sin. To see that righteous indignation that he was feeling that says, I did right, he did wrong. You know, I should be getting the calf, not him. Uh, Ernie and I talk about this all the time. Uh, somewhere along the line, I had a question pop in my head. Would you rather be, let me make sure I say this right. Uh, would you rather be right or do right? Would you rather be right or would you rather do right? Uh, and it's, I ask that, I pose that to people every once in a while. It's interesting, the answers I get. But in this case, the brother would better, rather be right. You know, I did what I'm supposed to do. I followed the rules. I, the father's saying, come inside anyway. Show some grace, show some mercy. I'm showing it to you. I've shown it to you your whole life. You know, uh, uh, become more appreciative of what you've got. This relationship you've got with me is something that you're taking for granted. Sometimes we take it for granted. Sometimes we think we've got to have more. <clears throat> the prodigal learned this and acted on it. He said, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me a servant. Big, big brother says, I proved myself a servant. Works. Make me a son. Salvation through the works. We don't know what the big brother chose. He was left with an invite to go in as the story ends. <clears throat> I think it's, uh, I think it's us up, up to us to finish the story, and I'll tell you why in a second. After completing this lesson, <clears throat> I was also given the same invite. Um, a few years ago at camp, you know, I'm, I'm, again, Kind of obvious sometimes when God is in developing a lesson and putting it together. I mean, just a little thing about change the change the title, focus on the dealing with, not on the difficult people. <clears throat> but when I got through with this and I was ready to teach it and felt like, okay, I've got it where I want it, God said, uh, you can't teach it. Uh, and I said, really? I said, what? You know, he said, not till you live it. And I had no idea what he was talking about. <clears throat> and he brought to mind something that happened at our camp a few years ago. We had a, a situation where a staffer did something that required the, them to be removed and sent home. <clears throat> and, you know, it was, it was absolutely right to do it. I mean, you know, there's no righteous ending. I mean, it was the right thing to do. I think everybody that was involved in it knew that. And a few days later... Uh, an adult friend of that staffer 
uh, called me and, and spoke to me about it. And that's where I drew the righteous indignation weapon. And I said, uh, you know, basically, I'm right, you're wrong. You know, too bad, tough. And I took a very hard, rigid stance. And God pointed out that, you know, you can be rigid, but keep in mind that really the only rigid people are in cemeteries. So, you know, don't, don't, do, don't go there. He said, uh, he said you, you were... You were you didn't show this person any love. You didn't show this person any compassion. You didn't treat them with kindness. You didn't, <clears throat> you didn't uh, edify them, and you didn't glorify me. And as a result, you've lost a family that's been with you for years that you've been, had great ministry with, and now they won't have a thing to do with you. And uh, I, you know, I said, yep, you're right. I did. You're absolutely right. Lesson learned. Uh, I'll, I'll know next time. He said, no. I said, no, you've got to fix this one. And I thought, well, I mean, I'm not really sure how to get in touch with them. And I thought, well, okay, Facebook. So I went to Facebook, and, the, and really the, only, the one that I offended, that was the one I went to. And I sent them a note, and I told them all that. I said, in my devotion today, God brought you to mind, and, you know, I, I treated you badly. I, and I went, just went down the list of how badly I treated them, and I apologized to them and asked them for forgiveness, and, when I sent the message, I thought, um, you know, she, they're, they're, she's going to, if she could tear it up, she would. I mean, it's a Facebook message, but she'll ignore it. So I sent the message, and within a few minutes after that, I went online. As a matter of fact, I went on Facebook, and <clears throat> I saw where that post, person was making a post saying that they uh, were having a grandchild born that day. I thought, Wow. You know, that's like, you couldn't get in a better frame of mind. I mean, you're, you're, you're elated, you're happy, you've got a grandchild being born, and, you know, it's almost like asking for a donation at Christmas. People are a little more giving and a little, a little more loving, and uh, I thought, well, this is good timing, Father. You know, to send her this, this message of, you know, apology and forgiveness, asking for forgiveness at a time where she's kind of on a high anyway. Uh, and within a few minutes, I got a note back saying, I... I you can't tell how much you I appreciate this, and uh, I forgive you. And then God said, okay, now you can teach the lesson. He said, you gotta, you got to put into practice, you know, what you're, what you're going to speak on because you had to deal with a difficult person. You didn't deal with them right. And so, <clears throat> you know, he does that to us. Uh, but at the same time, that's how you know God's in the message. Uh, he kind of he makes you jump through hoops and ringers and so forth and points out the things that we need to do because he wants us to teach what we've learned and what we live. Otherwise, we're just wasting everybody's time. So I just want to share that with you this morning and share this message. Uh, we all face difficult people. We can be difficult people. Uh, help us to, you know, Father, help us to see when we're difficult and help us to uh, identify the ones that are difficult and how to deal with them. I'll deal with them properly because it's always, always about ministry and about relationships and it's about restoration of, and, and giving us an opportunity to rejoice together.